Go with me to Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7. All right, Luke chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 20. Oh, let's see. Let's start in verse 24. Luke chapter 7, verse 24. And when the messengers of John were departed, he began to speak unto the people concerning John. Here's what he said. What went ye out into the wilderness for to see? A reed shaken with the wind? But what went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they which are gorgeously apparelled and live delicately are in king's courts. But what went ye out for to see? A prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and much more than a prophet. This is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. And notice what he says next. I was reading this one day, and as I read through it, and one of my standard practices, and it's not like a ritual or anything, it's just I've said it, and now it's what I do, and now I don't have to think about it, I automatically do it. And that is before I ever just even start reading the Bible, I have already decided whatever I read, I'm going to believe. It's just that simple. Now, that doesn't mean I'll always understand it when I read it, but I will believe it even if I don't understand it. And once I believe it, then it's up to God through the Holy Spirit to bring me understanding. See? But if I don't believe it, then he doesn't even have to bring me understanding. So the first choice is to decide to believe. So that's what I do. Now, so here he says in verse 28, I was reading this one day and it struck me and it was one of those times where I had to actually stop and kind of start again. He said, For I say unto you, among those that are born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. And I read that and I said, okay, wait a minute. Uh, that how, and like I said, I already decided I believe this. Jesus said it. I believe it. But how can it be true? How, how is that true? Because you look at John, he's the greatest prophet. And I started thinking, there's a lot of good prophets in the Bible. You know, you got Moses parting the Red Sea. You've got Elijah calling fire down from heaven. I mean, there's a lot of stuff in the Bible. And a lot of these prophets were pretty powerful prophets. And I said, and here's John. He didn't even have a miracle. He had nothing like that. So how could he be a better prophet? So <clears throat> the first thing God asked me was, well, what's a prophet? And whenever God asks you a question, uh, he's not looking for the answer. He already knows the answer. But he wants you to realize you don't know the answer. So instead of assuming you know it, go find out what it says. And so I went and looked up the word prophet, and it literally said, one who has a message from God or one who speaks for God. I said, okay, well, that, that changes things a little bit because now uh, for John to be the greatest prophet, he didn't have to have miracles. He just had to have the greatest message. So if he's the greatest prophet, he should have had the greatest message. So I started looking at it, and I started realizing if, if John had the greatest message, what was his message? And so I went back, if he had the greatest message between all the other prophets, what were the other prophets' message? All the other prophets kept saying, he's coming, he's coming, he's coming. And that's all they prophesied for thousands of years. They prophesied, he's coming, he's coming. John was the first prophet that got to stand up and say, he's here. And when I realized that, I said, okay, that's because he said, behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Isn't that right? And I thought, all right, so okay, I've, I've solved that now. Uh, John's the greatest prophet because he had the greatest message and the greatest message was he's here. And then I kept on reading and the next part really kind of messed me up because after he said he was the greatest prophet, he said, then he said, but he that is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Now, I already had a problem originally with John being the greatest, but if I had a problem with John being the greatest, I sure had a problem of thinking, okay, but even if I'm the least in the kingdom, I'm greater than John the Baptist. And I thought, okay, God, how is that? How, how, how does that work? And he said, well, it's simple. He said, John, all the other prophets were saying he's coming. John had the greatest message because he said he's here. But John also had to say, there goes and watch him go off into the wilderness. And he said, no Christian will ever say there goes because he will never leave you nor forsake you. He abides in you. He resides in you. He dwells in you. And that's what makes us greater than John the Baptist. I don't care who you are. I don't care if you're the least in the kingdom, as Jesus said. Even if you're the least in the kingdom, you are greater than the greatest prophet. Now, when you read that, 
then you start to realize, okay, there is something to this new man, to this new creation that maybe we haven't dove into deep enough to really see the results of what this new creation did. Because once we realize what this new creation truly is, we start to realize how we can be greater than John the Baptist. Why? Because his indwelling in us makes us different. And he has invested this, as I said yesterday, this, this treasure in these earthen vessels that we are able to bring God's power, his spirit, his character, his nature to the world. And we do it in a way that represents him accurately because in our spirits, we have been recreated to be able to carry the very spirit of the living God. Nobody did that before us. Right. Amen. You got to realize now in the, in the Old Testament, uh, the power of God, the spirit of God would come upon the prophets. But that's not what he does for us. He, he dwells in us. Jesus said, uh, this spirit, the spirit of truth, he is with you and he shall be in you. Jesus made a distinction. He is with you, but he shall be in you. And he said, it's better for you that I go away because if I don't go away, then I cannot send the spirit back to you. But it's better for you that I do because if I go away, then I can send the spirit back and he will abide with you forever. Amen. See, we've not delved into that enough to be able to look at it and say, what is the result of us having this spirit of the living God? Because we're talking about, as I said in the last session, we're talking about the, the spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead. That's the potential power that is in you. And if he can raise Jesus from the dead, I guarantee you he can fix any problem you'll ever face. Yep. Because that was the greatest display of God's power that was ever unleashed in the universe. And so we need to realize that and realize what we have in us and be able to live that out. No other people have ever been able to say the things that Christians can say. No other people, even, even the Old Testament saints, if you read in them, um, uh, back in Hebrews, he actually tells us uh, at the end of Hebrews 11, he said that they without us could not be made perfect but God has provided some better thing for us. And now think about that. They were waiting on us. They were waiting. And in Hebrews 12, the very beginning tells us, he said, seeing that we have this great cloud of witnesses. Well, what cloud of witnesses is he talking about? It's all the heroes of faith out of, Hebrew, out of Hebrews 11. He's, he went through the whole list of people. And then he said, that great cloud of witnesses, they're all watching you. They're all looking at you. And they're all thinking, do something with what you've got. If we'd have known, if we'd have had what you've got, we could do something. Well, look at what they did do, even without what we have. So how much more should we be doing and able to do than what even the Old Testament saints could do? Jesus himself said the same thing. He said, the same, if you believe on me, the same works I do, you will do also and greater. See, we should be doing so much more with what we've got, but we end up getting distracted. We end up getting, letting the cares of this world and everything else get in our face instead of keeping the word of God before our face and always moving forward into the things that God has prepared. So it says that he has, that there are good works that he has foreordained that we should walk in. Think about that. Think how many good works. God's got, a, God's got his own to-do list for you. you know, he's got his own day planner. Okay, And he said, today, this is what I've got. These are the good works I have laid out that I expect you to fulfill. Why? Because so that, you know, he can, so that we can be saved? No, because we're saved. Right? Because we're saved, we get to do these things. Right. It's not to be saved. People ask me all the time, well, you know, uh, about uh, when they would ask us, they said, you know, I have to remember the exact wording that they gave me. Um, <clears throat> yeah, because we were talking about the Word of God. And I said, look, I don't heal the sick. I, I, I don't do these things because the sick get healed. The sick get healed because I do these things. You understand? In other words, people say, well, you know, if you see something, if, if I was to see a miracle, I'd get activated. Man, I'd go after it. And, so, and Jesus said, no, more blessed is he that believes and doesn't see, hasn't seen, right? He said, blessed are you. You've seen this, but more blessed are those that haven't seen this. So we are already more blessed because we didn't see Jesus in the flesh. We didn't see the miracles he did, but we choose to believe. So that takes greater faith. So we're already at a higher faith level than those guys were. 
And we need to, and I'm not putting them down. God bless them. I mean, that's, you know, <laughs> that was a particular uh, good place to be in, right? But we need to realize where we are and what we're supposed to be doing with this. And God has foreordained good works for us to walk in. Every time you walk past somebody that's sick, that's one of your good works. That's, that's somebody that God has caused to coincide with you, to intersect with you, so that you can fulfill the good works that God has prepared for you. It's not about you getting in condemnation. Oh, well, I didn't pray for everybody I saw. That's not it. It's a matter of you realizing God wants you to partake of these things. Why does God want us to lay hands on the sick? You know, uh, one of the questions was if people get healed at a distance, how does God get the glory? Because sometimes we don't know what goes on. And there's been many times. But the fact is, see, the thing is, I don't give God the glory for their healing when I hear their testimony. I give God the glory for their healing when I lay hands on them. You understand? Or when I pray for them at a distance, I'm already glorifying God because I know if I do my part, he will do his part. See, that's what faith is. Faith is not waiting to hear the results. Faith is understanding and believing the results before you hear them. Right? I can give you uh, at least four or five just off the top of my head of situations. As a matter of fact, I was in, um, where was I? I was up in, up in uh, North Carolina. I was in Asheville, North Carolina. And I went we were there doing meetings and it's a kind of drawn out story, so I'm not going to talk about it right now. But we were meeting in homes, three homes. I, I taught every day in three different homes. I teach in the morning, uh, like nine, kind of like this, nine to noon. And then I would walk down the street. I'd eat a little uh, meal and I'd teach in one home from nine till noon. And then I'd go to another house from two to five or from a noon, a little afternoon, actually, and teach till about three or four. And then we'd break for lunch. And then I'd go back to the third or go down to the third house house and teach there from about six in the evening till about nine or 10 or sometimes 12 or whatever. And I did that every day uh, for over a week. And there were different people in each house. And that was the only way we could get to everybody because we didn't have a church or anything to invite us in. Well, there was a pastor there that heard about us. And he said, would you preach on, uh, on this Sunday? Actually, he said Saturday. We could use it for Saturday. I said, yeah. So we went to his church and I preached. And then the, sun, the next Sunday, I said, whenever they came in, I said, um, uh, well, actually, it was Saturday night because we we're getting ready for the healing service. I'm trying to make sure all the details are right. And so that when we broke for lunch, there was a lady that said, uh, would you go with me and pray for this little girl? And she had leukemia. And I said, yeah, I'd be glad to. So we went over to the house and the mother was getting the little girl ready to go to the doctor because she had to have a blood transfusion several times a week. I mean, it was a lot. It was really rough on her. The little girl was just a little, little girl. And this leukemia, it was killing her. So when we got there, she was lying on the couch, totally gray. Uh, the mother was getting ready to get the little girl and go take her to the hospital so she could get this transfusion. And so we get there, and the, the people that took us over there kept the mother busy, basically. Because a lot of times when you start ministering to children, the parents get in the middle of things. And if you get a little stern talking to the enemy, uh, they don't like that. When you, and, and I'm very careful around children how I minister anyway because you don't want to put fear into them. You don't want to scare them, that kind of stuff. So you can be gentle. But many times parents get involved. And many times devils in parents will stir up when you start ministering to their kids. And the sickness will cause this thing to stir up and cause the parents to interfere. And so we've just found it best, if we can, to kind of separate them, keep them at a distance while we're ministering to the children. So I sat down next to a little girl, and she couldn't even raise up. And I... I Spoke to her a little bit and talked to her and just told her what I was going to do. I said, I'm going to lay my hands on your head. And when I get done, this is not going to bother you anymore. And I said, and you're going to be healed. I said, is that okay? And she, yes, okay. So I just laid my hands on her head and just commanded, right? And I didn't say, you devil, go. I just, wasn't nothing than that. I just laid my hand and said, in the name of Jesus, be healed, be free. See, if I say be free, that devil knows it's got to go. I don't have to tell the devil to go. But for her to be free, it has to go. So it will obey. That's how Jesus spoke to the fig tree. He didn't tell the fig tree to die. He just said, no man will eat fruit of you hereafter forever. The fig tree had to figure out, how can I make that happen? Oh, okay, I'll have to die. And it did. Okay? So, but do you see what I'm saying? You see the point, right? You don't have to be so specific sometimes in these things. Now, so when we, as soon as I laid hands on her, uh, I didn't see an instant change. And so we went back to church after we went and ate lunch and went back to the church. And the mother took the little girl to the hospital to get the transfusion and get everything done. And so when we got back there that evening, I got up and I said, well, all right, what'd y'all do for lunch? You have a good lunch, everything's good. I said, what'd y'all do? And everybody said, well, we had lunch, we did this. I said, all right, let me tell you what I did. 
I got to go see God heal this little girl of leukemia. And, and immediately, it was the strangest thing because nobody said anything, but it was like I heard the whole crowd say, what did you see? And I just, so I answered it. They didn't even say it out loud, but I said, oh, I, okay. You, you, you're thinking, what did I see? So that's what kind of people you are. You have to see something before you'll believe. And I said, then you ought to follow me around because I believe it. And because I believe it, I will see it. And if you need to see it to believe it, then you need to follow me around because if you follow me around, you'll see it because I'm believing. And so they got real quiet because I was pretty direct with them. And they were pretty religious in some areas and other stuff. So I kind of blasted them. And I, and now, but you have to remember, I didn't see a thing. I didn't see anything happen. And then that night, that evening, we went back to the house where I was staying. And about 6.30 the next morning. Uh, now, first off, we did hear that the little girl didn't need the transfusion. So we knew that that was a good sign. And about 6.30 the next morning, the husband and wife were downstairs. And I was up in the room where I was staying. And they started, the phone rang. And I heard it ring, but I didn't think anything. And all of a sudden, the lady started yelling, uh, Brother Curry, it's an emergency. It's an emergency. You need on the phone. Please, please come, come down quick. And just screaming and hollering. And so I ran downstairs real quick and got on the phone. And this person on the other end is screaming. I mean, just screaming. And that means one of two things. Somebody got healed or somebody died. That's usually the two things it means. And so the first thing I have to do is calm them down. I said, okay, uh, what's, what's, what's going on here? What's, what's happening? And it was that little girl's mother. And she said, my, my daughter, my daughter, she, she, she's sitting up. She hadn't sat up in, in, in like eight months or something, seven or eight months. Hadn't, she's not sat. This morning when I went in, she, she said she wanted breakfast. She never eats. She never has an appetite. I have to make her eat. And I said, okay, good. That's good. And she said, she, she's ate more than I did. <laughs> and I'm like, that's good. I said, now, I said, she's healed. She's, she, I, I, I just, I want to thank you for giving my, my daughter back. Thank you so much for giving my daughter back. She said, this is just, a, and just immediate. But now, I didn't see that today. When I left, I didn't see that. She was still lying on the couch, still lying there. Not, didn't sit up quick and all that kind of stuff. It was, but it was less than 24 hours. And so we heard that. Now, give you another example. I was up in Vancouver, Washington. No, I'm sorry, Portland, Oregon, right across the river there. And we were in a Best Western Motel uh, meeting room, having the meeting there, and had several different people there. Actually, John Lake's uh, granddaughter was there. And the, uh, actually, one of the people that is mentioned in one of Lake's letters as a young boy is mentioned. He was there, and I got to meet them and talk with them. So it was kind of a neat meeting already. Well. Year, about two years before that, we had gone up there and I taught, uh, I did a DHT at Warner Pacific College. And at that college in the uh, auditorium, we had about 1,400 people that went to the DHT. And it was, it was an awesome meeting, but it was so packed that when it came time for the healing service, we couldn't do it. We had to have the healing service on the platform in the auditorium, which was a big platform. And we brought people up, we lined them up in, in lines of 50 shows you how big the platform was, had 50 going across. And then we did like three or four lines. And then we, I've just walked through and just prayed for them. Wasn't long, any long drawn out thing. If pretty much at that point, I was still just kind of touching them. And I just went down in Jesus name, be healed, be healed in Jesus name. And just went down the, the whole row. And when I got done with the row, they would go off and another row would come on and we would just cycle them through. Well, down in front, there was a man on a stretcher and he'd been paralyzed. He had a, a motorcycle wreck and was paralyzed from the neck down. They gave him no chance of ever walking again. He had like a 5% chance of living, but he had no chance of ever walking again. And so he's down there. And at one point, while they were lining the people up, I got down, went off the platform, went down, laid hands on him, just touched him. And I put a, a hand on his arm, one on his leg. I said, in the name of Jesus, right now, be healed head to toe. Limbs, you begin to function correctly. We command all the nerves to function. Sometimes it gets specific, sometimes it don't. It doesn't matter either way. And so I just commanded, probably 30, 45 seconds. Went back up on the platform, kept praying for people. After about 20, 30 minutes, there was a little roar that kind of went up from the people that were gathered around him. And I said, oh, well, what's going on down there? And they said, he can feel when we touch his toe, we can, he can feel when we touch his leg and he can feel it before he couldn't feel it. And I said, glory to God, okay, that's good. So we broke that thing, so now we got it. So the rest of it has to go. Right? You don't just stop there. You, you, you push. If, if we can do that, we can do the rest. If, if, we couldn't, if we couldn't do the rest, we wouldn't have been able to do that. And I said, so he'll, he'll be free. We command life, command healing in Jesus' name. Went back to praying people. 
at, before they left. Now, I didn't see any change. Uh, I, I didn't, you know, I heard movement. I mean, I heard he had uh, feeling in his legs and that kind of stuff. And the feeling was moving up. So I know he was getting feeling back, but there was no movement. He didn't jump off the stretcher. He didn't run back, which is, would have been great. I would have loved it, but, and I'm sure he would have loved it, but that's not what happened. So we left. Actually, on the way out, we went to an Applebee's to eat, and there was a couple sitting there. They didn't know we'd been there. And I'd seen them before. I'd prayed for the woman before. The woman had breast cancer. And whenever we saw them, when we walked past, they were sitting there, and they said, Ah, oh, Brother Curry. Uh, we didn't know you were in town. I said, yeah, we just finished meetings. And I said, he said, I don't know if you remember us tonight. He said, last year when you were up here, he said, uh, we were in, uh, my wife was in your healing line. I said, really? I said, well, what was it for? Because I, I didn't really remember. And he said, uh, well, she had breast cancer. I said, well, how's things going? Oh, she's healed, totally healed. The doctor says she's completely healed. I'm like, well, that's good. Did you, did you send her in the testimony? No, we've been meaning to, but we, we forget. And, you know, we're, and I'm like, well, it'd be good, you know, write it out. It's good for people to read. And because and, we, we stretch our faith out there and we don't let it go. We don't turn loose until we get the testimony that they're healed. So we continue. And then some things, it's still working. Even if I'm not thinking about it, it's still working because faith doesn't work by you thinking, right? Faith is out of the spirit. So you attach it and you leave it there until it's done and you don't draw it back. Now, and the way you draw it back usually is by, not seeing something and then saying, well, we didn't see anything, so I guess it didn't happen. Well, you just withdrew your faith. So don't, don't do that. Just leave it there. Let it, let it be like a water hose watering a plant until the thing is done, All right? And so we talked a little bit with them and the woman being completely healed, hadn't seen any testimony. So then we leave and then like two years later, we're back up in that area. We're over at the Best Western Hotel. We're in the meeting room and I'm up there teaching. I'm fixing to take a break and I see this guy walk in the back and you know I didn't think anything about it nice dress suit and so when we take the break I walk back toward the back where the well honestly where, where the refrigerator was where my coke was that's what I was going back there for and so I was taking a break walking back and when I got back there when I walked past this guy this young man nice looking young man said uh, brother Curry how are you doing I said I'm doing good he said uh, do you remember me and I said well you look familiar but no honestly I don't I see a lot of people he said, two years ago, you were over at Warren Pacific College. He said, and, and I was the guy on the stretcher. And I looked and I'm like, no. Really? I said, look at you. I said, so you're healed. And he goes, totally healed. He said, within a week after you left, he said, I started having feeling. I started having this. I started, uh, could have motion going on. He said, and then one day I woke up and he said, when I woke up, I saw something on my dresser. And he said, I rolled out of bed, walked over to it and got there and picked it up before I realized I was walking. And he said, but I was completely healed. He didn't feel the healing, right? But he was healed. If, if doctors can put you under even a local anesthetic and you can watch them cut on you and you not feel it, then surely the God of heaven and earth can heal you without you feeling it, right? And if you wait for the feeling, many times you won't even experience the feeling even though you were already healed, right? And there are people that get healed and then because they deny it, the thing ends up coming back on them. You need to testify of your healing to keep it, right? There's a, pros there's a, a, a process there. So, and the reason I'm saying this is because I want you to realize uh, what I do, I don't do because I see people healed, right? I see people healed because I do what I do. Amen? We were in, um, I'll give you one more real quick. We were in... And actually, this is all my notes, so I was going to tell you this one anyway. So there you go. Just so you know, I'm on target here. Right? I'm, not, I'm not just rambling, okay? So I was, uh, we had gone to Italy uh, in 2005, I think it was, and we went over, we were invited to go over, went over, and I got to preach Paul's gospel, you might say, in Rome. And we got to go to where Paul and Peter are said to have been in prison, in the Mamertine prison. And we got to see all these things, go to the Colosseum, all that kind of stuff. Uh, well, on this trip, it was the most amazing trip because... We, we didn't plan it this way. But when we went over, we happened to be in Rome and we were in uh, Reggio di Calabria, which is down in the heel of the boot, I guess you would say. Um, we were there for like a week and then we went to Rome. The, it just so happened that the day we got to Rome is the one day of the year when they close all traffic. There can be no traffic on the roads and that going to and from the Colosseum. And so everybody's walking. And the beauty of it is when you're there, you could, everybody walks from the Colosseum and then they walk over to the Vatican. 
And it just so happened they had just elected a new pope. And we didn't, I was not even aware of that, to be honest with you at the time. And so we go around to the Vatican and just seeing things because my mother-in-law was with us and she wanted to see the, um, the museum there. And, and so we were going in and we're walking around the corner and there's this huge crowd of people right in the Vatican Square, I guess it's the courtyard. And we start walking, with, you know, kind of looking at this crowd of people and we're looking around it. And about that time, out comes the new pope. He comes out and starts waving at everybody. And we're like, who is that? You know, and they're like, that's, that's the new pope. And we're like, really? What happened to the old one? You know, it's like, he died. I'm like, oh, okay, well. And, it's and they're just telling us all this stuff. It's like, we don't even know what's going on, you know. But here we are. We just happen to walk up on the scene when the pope comes out. And we thought, well, that's, that's kind of neat, you know. I've never seen a pope in li you know, real life before, so kind of neat. So then we leave and we fly back to, uh, we're having to come back through London on our way back home. And we get to London. I've been there before, so I told him, I said, let's ride into Victoria Station. I'll take you kind of on a tour downtown. I can show you some neat stuff. I can show you Buckingham Palace. I can show you 10 Downing Street. I can show you, you know, these things. And so we go into town and we go over to Buckingham Palace. There's this huge crowd there. And we walk around like, I said, man, last time I was here, it was like a park and people were laying out on the, you know, on the park and just laying there and had their dogs around them. And I said, it was really calm and peaceful. And here you got all these people. And we started noticing all these uh, policemen are walking around with machine guns and all that kind of stuff, which is not, hadn't been normal for them at that time. And I'm like, hey, something's up. So we go over to Buckingham Palace, we walk up. And we could hardly get there because of all the people were right up against the gates. And about that time, we're standing there and we... We're, we're standing there watching, you know, kind of like what's going on, and we hear these jets coming, and all these jets come flying and they swoop down. It's like, wow, that's cool, it's loud, and, come up. and about the, as soon as they pass overhead, the doors on Buckingham Palace open up, and here comes the royal family. Everybody comes walking out. The queen mother, all of them come walking out. They all stand, you know, side by side. They all do their little cupped hands, you know, thing like this, going back and forth. And so we're just watching. I'm like, that's the queen. That that's. And there's that other guy, the, guy with the, the other guy, her, you know, the prince, whoever. You know, the, and it's like, I, I couldn't remember his name at the moment. I, there's the other guy, the, the one that was married to the pretty lady, the him. You know. Yeah, no, well, back then I didn't know that. I'm like, I don't, I don't even know his name. I just know the other lady. And so we're looking and watching. And here, I've never, listen, I had never seen a living president of the United States in person. And here I've seen the Pope and now I've seen the Queen of England, right? <laughs> And it just, it just happens that we were there. It was the day of her 50th birthday. And so her 50th year of her reign or something like one of the two. But I, mean, I guess that's a big difference. But anyway, <laughs> we were, so, <laughs> shows you how much I keep up with it, right? But so we see all this stuff and then we get back on the train. We have to come back and we come back to America. Well, when we were in Italy, first we were in Reggio de Calabria and we were up in this, we had to go from downtown and that's where Paul preached. Whenever it says he preached in, in the Regium, in, in Acts, that's Reggio de Calabria. It's the same city. There's actually a church there that they say is, was built on the spot where Paul preached and where, where he preached deep into the night and they said that that's where it was at. Well, they actually have a candle there and whenever he, supposedly the tradition was, when he started preaching, they, he said, I want to preach and it was on the side of a Jewish synagogue and he said, uh, they said, well, we'll let you preach but you can only preach uh, until this candle burns out. When it burns out, you got to stop. And the, the idea is, or the tradition is, the candle that was supposed to last like three hours ended up lasting over 12 hours. Mm -hmm. And so that was a miracle and let him preach deep into the night, as I said. So anyway, that was, that's the tradition. So we're there. We're staying in this hotel. Uh, well, it's not a hotel. It's an apartment complex that the people that invite us, uh, they own it. And in the bottom is an olive oil press. Uh, where they make olive oil. So you smell olive oil all through the place. I mean, it, you stay hungry the whole time you're there, right? Because you're constantly smelling. And so we get there, and I'm traveling with my, it's myself, my wife, my daughter, and my mother-in-law. And that was it, right? Which right there tells you there was something wrong, that I should have at least had one other young man with me. Because when you travel with three women, you travel with the luggage for three women, and we were over there about a month, so we had all of this stuff, and it was my responsibility to make sure the luggage gets everywhere. So I'm constantly going back and doing all the luggage. So um, we have to get on this elevator, and elevators in Italy are like closets. I mean, they're small, right? When you get on an elevator with people in Italy, 
If you don't know them when you get on with them, you'll know them very well by the time you get off, right? Because <laughs> you are very close to one another. And so we get on this elevator and I have to get the luggage on. And so I have to ride it by myself. So I have to put the luggage on and then I have to get up on the luggage and sit on the luggage <laughs> to take it up. And then when I get there, I have to unload it and I have to make all these trips. So finally, whenever I get all that done, the, they get on and I can't get on with them because the, the elevator isn't big enough for all of us. So they get on and it was uh, several, I think seven floors, something like that. And so there's a stairway there. So I'm thinking, you know, in 2005, you know, I'm, I'm thinking I, I wasn't as old then as I am now, okay? And even then I didn't feel like I was as old as I was then. And so I, I, I thought, now I'm gonna surprise them. They're riding up, I'm just gonna run up, the, run up the stairs. I'll get up there and I'll be waiting on them when they get there, okay? Well, actually I did beat them there, but I wasn't waiting on them because when I got up there, it was on the top floor and there was an exit out into the patio area, which was on top of the, uh, on top of the building. And so I run up these stairs and I mean, by the time I get there, I'm blacking out. And I'm, I'm not, and so I had to get, I'm like, there's not enough air in this room. And so I had to open the door and go out on the, on the patio area. And I'm thinking, I got to stay away from the edge because if I pass out, I don't want to fall over. So I have to stay right in the middle and trying to breathe. And so all this going on. And so every day we had to drive these cars up from, from that place uh, in the city, up on top of this mountain where the church was. Beautiful church. We drive it up. So I'm going up and every day they, they loaned us a car and the roads are very small and every car there is dented. And I mean, because they're constantly, I mean, you just drive and they'll just, boot, and you'll be driving and somebody will hit you and, the, and you look over and they're like, hello, <laughs> and keep on going. It's like, don't we need to stop and call the cop? No, it is. And, and so this, we get up there and I told this guy, I told the guy with me, I said, the, it was their car. I said, some people hit us. On the way up here, they hit us. Oh, that's all right, brother. Cody. That's okay. It's, we say, oh, we, we call it. He's kissed the car. We just kissed the car. That's all. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, well, this car's been kissed a lot, right? <laughs> I mean, because it was you could hit dents all over it. So we're driving up, and then finally one day they said, um, uh, brother Curry, there's this young man over here that got shot, and he's brain dead, and they're going to pull the plug. And if they do, they're going to file charges on his uncle because his uncle was the one that shot him. I never found out if it was accidental or purpose or whatever. I don't know. But they said, would you go pray for this young man? I said, yeah, we'll go. So we, we go to the hospital and the hospital there in Italy, it's different than here. Right. First off, they wouldn't let everybody go in. And so they only let me in. And they said, would you, when you go in, uh, Angelo is the guy's name. He's right around the corner. So he's right around the corner there. You'll see him. And I said, okay, so they let me go in. And whenever they made me go in, they made me put the gloves on, the mask, all that stuff. And so I'm going in there and I'm looking for Angelo and there he is. So I walk over to him and then I look around and he's in a room with like 12 other people. Huge room. About, oh, it's about this side actually. And they had beds for everybody. And I'm looking around and there are windows in this place that had no glass in them. It was just open windows. Birds fly through. And they make me put gloves on. And I'm thinking, why do they, why do the birds get to just fly through and I got to put on gloves and mask and all that kind of stuff. Some things just didn't make sense to me. So I walk over to Angelo and I put my hands on him and, I, and he's, he's lying there. His eyes are open, but they had to put the salve on him because he's not seeing anything. And so he's lying there and they got this machine on him and all this stuff's going on. And I lay my hands on him and I just walk over. I said, Angelo, I'm here to wake you up in the name of Jesus. Wake up in Jesus name. I said, now, when you wake up, your memory will be perfect. You'll remember everything. Everything will be good. Your body will function correctly in Jesus' name. Turned around and walked off. Didn't see anything. No change. Monitors didn't change. Nothing. So I walk out to the door, and there is a crowd of people waiting at the door for me. So as soon as I get in, and, and remember, there is a reason why I'm telling you this story. I want you to get the principle behind it. When I walked out the door, the first thing they said is, Brother Cody, did God speak to you? I said, well, yeah. Oh, what did he say? I said, he said, I shall lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. <laughs> Mark 16. He goes, oh, so, so the Lord, he did not speak to you? I said, yeah, he spoke to me. Oh, what did he say? He said, I will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. So the Lord, he did not speak to you though. I'm like, yes, he spoke to me. And we went back and forth. And the, here's something you have to realize. <clears throat> and, it, and I might have already told you this, but my wife has told me several times, I'm the most stubborn person she's ever met. And as I've always say, it's not stubbornness. It is called perseverance. 
right? Once it's sanctified, right? Well, but I can, but I can be very persevering, okay? And so they, they, we keep going back and forth. And they keep asking. And I keep saying, yeah, he said, it. You got, and I said, Mark 16. He said, I lay hands on the sick. But he didn't speak to you. Yes, he did. What did he say? He said, Mark 16. He said, lay hands on the sick. And so we just went through this thing. And I, I was determined, I'm not going to give in. I'm not going to stop, right? And so I had to get this across. So finally they quit. And they said, okay, well, we, we go home. I said, all right. So we start to leave. And on the way out, this is the second thing. Two things I remember about Italy, Angelo and Gelato, right? Gelato. It's amazing. Okay. There's nothing else like it on the face of the earth. Okay. I'm not big into sweets. I get all my sugar out of Cokes unless there's gelato around. If there's gelato, I will eat it. All right. It is Italian ice cream. There's nothing else like it. Anyway, on the way out, we stopped and got some gelato. And that's when, that was my introduction to, gel, to gelato. So it's a good memory put with, with Angelo. All right. So even if Angelo had died, it had been a good memory. Because, okay, because of the gelato. In, no, okay, so. But anyway, we go down. So then later that evening, and we were in this top uh, penthouse area, and they had an intercom system. And the people that brought us there said, uh, he, call, he called me and said, uh, Brother Curry, can I come up and speak with you? And I said, yeah, come on up. So he came up, and I opened the door, and he said, um, he's standing there. And I know something's going on, but he had this weird look. And he's, he's him hawing around. He's like, um... Uh, yes, um, well, um, you know, and I'm kind of like, come on, man, spit it out. I ain't got all day here. Come on, what is it, you know? And he, uh, well, uh, um, and Angelo. I said, yeah, Angelo, what about him? What, what about Angelo? Ah, uh, well, hmm, Angelo. Angelo, he, he is, uh, um, he, he, he is a dead. And I'm like, what? Uh, Angelo, he, he, he is a dead. He, he, he is a dead. And I'm like, hmm, okay, that surprises me. And he's, he stands there and he's waiting for me to give an excuse. He's waiting there for me to tell him why it didn't work. And I'm just looking at him and he's looking at me and I'm looking at him. And, he's, and neither one of us is saying anything because he's waiting for me to give an excuse or say something. I wasn't going to nullify my faith. I laid hands and said, you will live. I said, you, you know, we wake up. And so I wasn't going to change anything. Right? Just because circumstances change doesn't mean I change. The word is forever settled. Right? And that's what I stand on. So I just stood there and looked at him. We looked at each other for a long time. And finally he says, okay, well, um, the, we, we will see you in the morning. And I'm like, okay. So he left and we were supposed to keep preaching the next day. And so I told my wife, I said, I'm fixing to go for a walk, which she knew that meant I'm going to go pray because that's how I like to pray is I like to get outside and just walk. And so I ride this elevator. I get on this elevator like this because you have to. And so I'm on this elevator. As soon as the door shut, I start talking to God. And I started telling him, this ain't, uh, this ain't the way it works. You didn't send me halfway around the world to come over here and give these people false hope, to come over here and preach healing and have people die. I said, Angelo lives. I don't care how he does it. I don't care if you resurrect him, raise him. I, I don't care. But Angelo lives or I quit. I said, I'm not going to do this. And so I'm going on and all the time I'm riding down. So finally it gets to the bottom, ding, doors open, everything stops. Why? Because... I wouldn't talk to you that way in front of anybody else. I'm not going to talk to God that way in front of anybody else, right? And so I get off, and for the next 45 minutes, I walk around praying in tongues. That's all I'm doing. Just praying in tongues, walk around. Finally, I get back, go back in. We go to bed, get up the next morning, go back up to the meeting. I'm getting wired up and on the microphone, and as I start to walk up, uh, this person runs up to me and goes, Brother Cody, Brother Cody, have you heard about Angelo? I said, well, I heard that he died, because that's what I heard. He said, no, no, Angelo, he lives. I said, no, I didn't hear that. Oh, yes, he lives. He, he, he wakes. He, he, he's speaking. He knows everything. Everything is wonderful. Angelo lives. And I'm like, oh, glory to God. Good deal. And so I start to walk up front. He goes, oh, Brother Cutter, yesterday when I tell you, uh, Angelo, he is a dead. Uh, uh, you look at me and you say, hmm, that surprises me. Why you say this? And I said, and because and, I stopped. And I said, because I'm not used to losing. And he goes, hmm. <laughs> Like that was some deep revelation <laughs> that we're not supposed to lose, right? And so we went up. But before, the amazing thing was, as I walked up through the church, it is, it's really neat to see it because the women all sat on one side, the men sat on the other side, the women still wore the, the, the lace things on their head and it was very proper, everything was just right, except for the one young man that came in that wore an English shirt and he didn't speak English. 
and it had a very profane word on it, on the front of it. But he was so proud of his shirt because it said English and I'm an American, so he wore it in my honor, right? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sitting there and he's right there and I'm like, does he know that's what that says? Because <laughs> I'll just tell you, it was the F word, okay. right? Okay. Right there in big letters. I mean, just right there. And I'm like, does, does, he, does he know this? Thing? <laughs> And, and, he's, and the, my interpreter said, well, what, what, what is that? What, what is that? And I'm like, uh, you don't want to know, but he don't need to wear that here. <laughs> and so somebody else finally told him. And then all of a sudden they, they kind of re reached over and whispered in his ear. And he's like, I mean, he was shocked. <laughs> and he runs to the side and pulls it off, right? Turns it inside out and puts it back on, right? And then comes back and sits down. <laughs> so, but it was so amazing because the word, by the time I got to the platform, the word had spread about Angelo. And this place was so packed that I, there was no room to walk. Even in the, the aisles, you had to kind of work around people. And they had the whole front lined up with wheelchairs, with people in wheelchairs and things that had come to the meetings. And the, it was, this church was brand new and had never been preached in before. And they let me be the first one to inaugurate it and to dedicate it. And so it, it was up on the top of this mountain. And the, the, it was built in a way that the walls moved so you could move them and open them and you would have open air all the way through and the wind would blow through and it was perfect weather. And as you, as, when you open these walls, you could look out and it's on the top of this mountain and you could look down and see the Mediterranean all the way around. It was one of the most beautiful places I've ever been, one of the most beautiful places I've ever preached in. And so we had all these open. Well, when the, when the doors were shut, they had windows and stuff and they had people outside and it got to the point where they had to open the doors to let and pull back the walls because the crowd got so big that they could put more people in that way. And when we would break for lunch, they would come out. And it was so funny because we we're having these great miracles take place. And at lunch, they bring the, the food and so And they come out and they say, uh, you, you want beer or you want vino? And I'm like, is that beer and wine? Yeah. No, neither. And I'm like, are we going to have to have an altar call? Is this going to be an evangelistic service here? Because everybody's drinking beer and wine. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You know? So, but it was, it was the culture I was raised in, in Pentecostal. I and mean, because my dad was an alcoholic, I have a thing. I hate beer. I hate alcohol, right? Uh, so I'm looking at this. And I'm thinking, I'm going to have to get all y'all saved because you're all, you're, you're obviously all going to hell. You know, that's, that was just my mind. And they're like, oh no, we do this. And when we go to France, we all drink wine. We're here. We all drink beer. And here, and so like, and God was doing miracles, so who was I to say anything? You know, so well, we go on, and as the word spread, when the people heard that Angelo, because everybody there knew Angelo, when they heard that Angelo was alive, people in the wheelchairs started getting healed. And they started getting out of wheelchairs, not because of anything we had done, but because they heard the testimony, their faith rose, and they started getting healed. And people started coming out, and they started giving testimonies. And that was one of the first times uh, that I started preaching without a tie and suit and that kind of stuff. We tried to be polite and res you know, respect their customs. But my interpreter, whose name also was Angelo, uh, was head of the Gideons in Italy. And he was interpreting for me, and he had on the suit, the tie, the whole bit, and that's what they're used to. And I, I told him, uh, I don't wear a tie. I said, because uh, if you wear a tie and you tighten it all the time, it cuts off the blood flow. And I said, and, and, and I was going through all this stuff with him until my... And, and I said, I, and besides, I said, I've been freed from that. I said, uh, religion always wants to make us look like we ought to be in a casket, right? <laughs> so, so religion always wants to make us to wear suits and ties and make us stand like this. And I said, and that way, if you close your eyes, you look like you're in a casket standing up. <laughs> and so I'm telling this guy this, right? And so finally, he hears that. And so finally, he just goes, he takes his tie, takes it off, starts, libertad, libertad, libertad. And I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, I guess he got liberty. I guess that's what he's saying. So, and, so, and then the next day, he wore blue jeans. And it was like shock. I mean, it was just because nobody did that over there. So, but that whole point, the, the reason I'm getting, the reason I told you the story about Angelo is because I, if you, there's two things you've got to know, as we said. Number one, you've got to know that healing is in the atonement, that it was paid for. Every person's healing of every disease has been paid for, right? So there is no reason on God's end, why anybody should not be healed. Now, the way to make that happen, the, the primary thing that you have to have in you is this. This word is God speaking to you. 
You don't bow off of it. You don't bend. You don't, you don't, you don't back off of it to any degree. You, you read what it says and you believe Psalm 119 verse 89. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. So as far as God is concerned, it's settled. Now we've got to decide as far as we're concerned, it's settled. We don't back off. We don't make excuses. Even if you have to stand there and look stupid, you stand there and look stupid because if you stand there and look stupid long enough on God's word, you will end up looking wise whenever the dust settles. Because if you stand on his word, his word will stand with you. And so the whole point of that story is this. When I came out that hospital, they were trying to get me. They, they thought I had to have a special word from God. And I do. It's called the Bible. I've got a word from God. I don't need a telephone call. I've got letters that are written, that are more sure. That's what even Peter said. He said, we have a more, he, he said, we were there and we heard God, the, we heard the voice speak from heaven and we have a more sure word of prophecy, which is this scripture. So even if we heard a voice from heaven, this scripture, this book is more solid and it is more sure and we are to stand on it. So the whole point of the Angelo story is stand. Find it in the scripture. Find the scripture to stand on. Don't back off. Don't bend. Don't allow anybody to talk about it. Don't try to explain it. If it doesn't look like it's working, it ain't over yet. You say, when is it over? When, it, when it's worked. Whenever it's changed, then it's over. Until then, it's in the process. When Jesus said this sickness will not be unto death, he did not say Lazarus wouldn't die. Did it end in death? No. Death was one stop along the way. It ended whenever Lazarus was raised. Amen. So don't back off. Don't give excuses. Don't make excuses. Don't think you have to explain. You don't have to explain. All you have to do is do the word of God. Amen. Yes. Take a break. We'll come back in about 10 minutes.